First off, I want to welcome everyone here to viewing right now. This is the Essex Democrats Gubernatorial Forum. I want to thank the candidates for being here. Uh, Rebecca Holcomb, Pat Winburn, Dave Zuckerman, Lieutenant Governor, and uh, of course, Ralph. And I'm sorry, Ralph, I'm, I'm always probably going to screw up that middle name. but can't pronounce it. Yeah. So Ralph Carbo also uh, joins us today. So we are going to ask some questions of the candidates. The format of this particular forum is this. Each candidate, uh, the first candidate for each question is going to have two minutes to answer the question. Those candidates that follow up will have a minute to answer the question. Um, and then we will, so we have already randomly selected the order for this particular forum, starting with Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman, then uh, Pat Winburn, uh, Rebecca Holcomb, and then Ralph Corbeau. Uh, I wanna thank Brian Sheldon for asking me to moderate this particular forum. I wanna thank uh, Tony for, sorry, Tony, I I'm, I'm, should have had it right in front of me, but Tony, all of your efforts to put this event together. Um, so, and again, thank everybody who's watching and uh, you know showed up for, for this important conversation that we need to have as we prepare for that August 11th primary and I don't think that there's a candidate here that would disagree. Get those, get those ballots and get them mailed in, okay? So reach out to your town clerk, get it taken care of. So let's start off right off the bat. Dave Zuckerman, you have the first question. Here it is. Uh, candidates, uh, so I'm sorry, whoever, whoever is elected governor, we're talking about COVID-19 right now. Whoever becomes governor will be taking on the unique challenge of COVID-19. This is like nothing ever a governor has had to deal with before. Um, in addressing COVID-19, what new policies would you be putting in place to keep Vermonters healthy? Dave. Sure, thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you, Brian and, and folks in Essex for hosting and uh, public access for putting this out to more folks. Really appreciate it. Uh, well, first and foremost, I do want to compliment the governor on doing a fair amount of this process really quite well. And I give him credit for that. He listened to the scientists. He looked, listened to the medical uh, professionals. And I think Vermont uh, stands out in doing well, not only by listening to science, but also fortunately by being a relatively low density state, uh, which has also been a benefit for Vermonters. But going forward, uh, one area that I think uh, we all agree on on this call is that masks should be mandatory. As we encourage tourists to come to Vermont, we encourage the opening of our economy in different ways. We know the science says masks are critically important uh, when folks are in close proximity uh, to reduce the spread of COVID-19. But let's do that for our economy. Let's do that for our workers in our restaurants, our workers in our stores. Not only should they be wearing masks, but all of us walking into those, those locations should be doing so. Uh, as we reopen, I would also say that we need to make sure we do more incorporating of the professionals on the front lines. If it's businesses, let's bring in those hospitality industry folks and really have a conversation about how best to do it. In our schools and in our early education centers, which are critical to reopening our economy, because it's so hard, of course, working from home with kids, we now value education even more, uh, not only in producing our future citizens and leaders, but also in enabling adults to get to work as the cat rubs against the computer and shakes it, excuse me. Uh, and uh, so I would be putting into place um, efforts with the, the teachers, with the early educators, with the business sector and different sectors of business for that matter, to really reopen in a smarter way uh, than <clears throat> giving three days notice or four days notice. When I had a round table conversation with early educators about a month ago, they pointed out that the information they were getting one day they had to put in air conditioners uh, or couldn't put in air conditioners, it had to be fans. So they went out and bought fans. And then three days later we're told, no, air conditioners are fine. We need to get consistent, clear uh, discussion with those groups in order to have clear guidelines as they reopen. Uh, and so those are some of the issues I would uh, address, uh, but there's more and I'm running out of time. So uh, I'll pass it on, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Pat. Well, the policies that I think would uh, keep voters healthy is uh, having health care for all. Uh, you know, health care is a right and it's our moral responsibility. 
uh, Senator Sanders and uh, Senator Leahy and Peter Welch are all doing a great job on the federal level uh, for uh, promoting health care for all. And I think that uh, Vermonters, uh, you know, that's a policy that would keep uh, voters uh, healthy. Um, I also believe that family leave is important. Uh, family leave is a, a family value. And, uh, you know, people uh, uh, have uh, elderly people to take care of, or they have uh, sick people, you know, sick relatives, or, you know, people that are incapacitated for any reason. Uh, they need to be, they need help, uh, to have family leave. And you know, basically, right now, uh, people should wear masks uh, when they're not socially distanced. And, uh, you know, they, they should go home and, and take care of their families. But it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to do. Thanks, Pat. Rebecca. Thank you. Um, so I think we all know that it's quite possible, in fact, probable that things are going to get worse, both economically and in terms of health, before they get better. We've seen how quickly the virus has re been spreading across the South. And we also know that some of our federal subsidies are running out, and it's not clear what else will be coming in terms of aid. I've put out some recommendations already. The first is we need to make sure that VDH, the Vermont Department of Health, which has outstanding employees, is sufficiently staffed to do the job we are going to need it do to do in the fall. We are planning right now are proposing to open up schools, open up child cares all at the same time. They have, uh, they have right now uh, 330, 44 fewer employees than they did in 2008. It's not clear to me that they have the capacity to manage multiple simultaneous outbreaks in many parts of the state. If we can't manage our health care issues and our COVID spread, we actually do not have economic recovery. And so that's one of the things in minutes, almost no time. I feel everyone's pain. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph. Uh, I think from a different perspective, uh, a lot of what's being done is counterproductive. They're not looking at the real underlying issue that's the most important, and that's the environment surrounding the COVID-19. While, uh, while people like Phil Scott are putting out all these uh, types of protocols, is sitting in the uh, House Committee on um, wildlife and uh, fish and natural resources are three bills, I should say four bills, H-261, H-262, H-263, H-267, which deal directly 30 with, seconds. With, with the um, contamination of the environment through biosolids and sludge. That's, that has been uh, proven. All the, uh, the bacteria exits the body in the form of feces, the COVID-19 bacteria. Why are these four bills that specifically target- 10 seconds. Part of, of, of tamping down the disease have been sitting in the House committee this entire session is ridiculous. These, are, you, these are bills that, are, that, would, that would solve long-term problems related yep. to COVID-19. All right, thank you, Ralph. Let's move on to another question still in relationship to COVID-19. Um, Pat, we'll start with you. In terms of dealing with the economic downturn the state has faced because of dealing with COVID-19, um, how would you address the loss of income that continues to happen for Vermonters and for Vermont businesses? Well, unemployment's going to dry up um, you know, at the end of the month. And I don't believe that we can just, you know, cut our way out of a, out of a, a recession. Um, you know, many of the programs that I support require us to increase investments during an economic downturn. And we just simply can't, um, you know, cut our way out of this. So I would support a few ways to generate uh, revenue. Um, number one, a more progressive income tax. Now, we don't believe that millionaires are going to head for the hills if we raise their taxes. And, you know, on the contrary, during the pandemic, the housing market has skyrocketed uh, with people that are anxious to move to Vermont and enjoy our Vermont way of life. You know, another way that uh, we should uh, support or to generate revenue is to tax and regulate pot. Um, you know, Massachusetts and Canada, uh, uh, Colorado, other states uh, generate revenue by taxing uh, pot. And just like we tax 
alcohol, uh, we should tax uh, pot. Uh, but a you know a percentage or a portion of that uh, tax money ought to be set aside to educate our children about the dangers of drug abuse and you know the, the horrible problems that that uh, can create. And but we also should cut private uh, contracts. Many of the tens of millions of contracted uh, services paid for with general fund dollars could be done internally, at a you know at a lower rate. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, we need to eliminate the private out-of-state corrections contracts. The taxpayers are paying ne nearly eight uh, million dollars for. Um, you know, we need more workforce uh, uh, development, and I think that uh, you know the people in uh, Vermont would benefit uh, by a more you know progressive but uh, democrat uh, democratic uh, you know policies uh, by. A, a democratic governor and okay. I believe governor to, to do that. Thanks, Ben. Rebecca. Thank you. So in addition to some of the issues that Pat raised, um, we need to do many things here because we're already looking at a $550 million shortfall. And we know we need to make sure families have the cash in hand they need to pay their bills, pay their rent, feed their families, and know that they're gonna be safe. And we are not clear yet what federal support we'll get. First thing we need to do is to the extent that there are opportunities to reskill people, give them opportunities to get new skills, to move into jobs that will continue to be viable in the context of COVID-19, we need to make that a priority. Statewide, we need to focus the available state revenues on priorities that keep people healthy and safe through what we now know is not just a short-term crisis. It will probably be with us for at least a year until we have a vaccine that keeps people safe. Second, we need to think about how to invest in Vermont. We spend $3 billion out of state every year on energy from other places. If we redirected even a purpose of that to the creation of local renewables, that would create good jobs in Vermont that pay good wages and that keep that, that money here in the state where it, it uh, contributes to our economy. And finally, we may have to borrow, but that would be a uh, something that we'd have to be extremely strategic about to make sure it was something that would pay for itself, like housing. Thank you. Ralph. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait one second, Ralph. Yeah. Go ahead. A couple of things could be done, just like uh, what Governor Richard Snelling did a number of decades back during another budget deficit, deficit in tough economic times. Raise revenue by a slight tax increase primarily on the highest income Vermonters. If you raise the uh, personal income tax rate on the top 5% of Vermonters whose income is over $125,000 per year, you could generate approximately $15 million annually. If you would end the capital gains tax exclusion, where most states tax 100% of capital gains from sale of stocks, bonds, or property, you could raise approximately $14 million annually. And if you enact a financial assets tax of one half of 1% on all stock, bonds, trusts and other financial instruments over $2 million, you could raise about $56 million annually in Vermont. Very simple. 10 seconds. Done. Oh, done. All right, thank you, Ralph. Dave. Well, first of all, I think we have to invest in the economy and invest in the infrastructure and put people back to work, making money that will churn in the economy and rebuild our state. And I would do that through something that's already been talked about some, which is a marginal income tax rate, as was talked about with the Snelling years, but also uh, the Trump tax cuts uh, yielded hundreds of millions of dollars to the top 5% of Vermonters uh, in each of these years. So I would tap into that work to uh, collect about half of that, which would be about $100 million a year to invest in affordable housing, to invest in weatherizing folks' homes. It was talked about the oil money and other energy that's sent out of state until the, the return on that investment is not immediate. You don't suddenly have a lot of money to do uh, what you wanna do just by waving a wand. But if we invested 15 or 20 million a year immediately into weatherization to save Vermonters money, they would then have their resources to spend locally and churn in the economy. The last quick thing I'll say is I would invest and expand as the state legislature just did in restaurants making food to deliver meals to people who are hungry which would be money that would go into the restaurants and immediately back into the economy through their employees, as well as into the economy by buying local food. And then you would have that money spent over and over. And that's the way to rebuild the economy. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. All right. So let's address, if we, if we can, uh, one, one final issue in relation to COVID-19 is the relationship to the budget. 
obviously with the lack of income coming in for Vermonters and Vermont businesses, there's going to be a lack of income coming into the state. So there is a potential shortfall. We don't, I, we don't know exactly what that shortfall is going to look like. But with that on the horizon, how do you think that you would attempt to adjust the budget to deal with the fact that you're going to have less income to do the things that you want to do? Start with Rebecca. Thank you. Um, first of all, David, thanks for mentioning the restaurant issue. And if people want to see what that looks like, there's some uh, interviews on my website where business owners are talking about how they used um, some of the COVID relief money to stay their revenue so that they could figure out a way to create revenue in the middle of being a, shut, a shutdown. Um, this is the biggest issue we face and part of the challenge is because of the delayed receipts we actually don't have an entirely clear fix on what our fiscal situation is. We do know it's bad. So as others have mentioned, I think we've begun to answer this question already. We need to look at how we capture additional revenues from people who can't afford to pay. We also need to look at how we, um, we spend differently to make sure that we're getting the best darn value out of every single dollar we spend. As agency of education secretary, that's what I spent my life doing. I took over an education agency that had had a 40% cut in its state funding and figured out how to rethink our operations in ways that let us punch above our weight. We're just gonna have to do that and focus on our priorities. And our priorities are making sure people are safe, people have homes where they can be, and people have enough food and opportunity and access to good education that will help us as we get through. Um, and we're gonna have to work across sectors how, how to do it, to leave people with a sense of hope. I've seen incredibly promising cross-sector partnerships starting between child cares and schools in some communities and between healthcare providers and schools in some communities. We support a tremendous amount of infrastructure in the state. And maybe that's where we don't want to spend our money because we want to spend it on our people. And when schools partner with child cares, they can bring down the operating cost of the child care by about a third in ways that let them pay more to the workers, but also bring down the cost to parents who are trying to figure out how to hold down their jobs, even if their kids are often home. That's what we have to do. And I spoke to one parent who said that last year she spent $185 a week on childcare. This year she's only spending $50 a week. That's because when the school pushed in and used its available space, it was they were able to make this a win for families and a win for people who need to go to work. So those are the kinds of uh, cross-sector strat strategic decisions I'll be looking for. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, well, I'm I'm not going to uh, stand for any uh, cuts. Uh, the, uh, the the bottom uh, line is when uh, there's 740 million billion dollars worth of potential revenues from taxpayer dollars that can uh, come back to the states is being spent on a uh, defense budget out of Washington D.C. Uh, not just going to sit back and allow that to happen. Uh, like they used to do in the 60s, we need to put together a coalition of top state leaders and uh, politicians and go to Washington DC and bang on the doors and tell them that this is unacceptable in modern society. To have $740 billion wasted away on endless wars or endless military industrial corporation profits when the states are, are wanting and lacking all the federal funds we used to be able to get back in the heyday. Uh, this, this is not something to be uh, to just uh, sit back and, and accept and go ahead and cut the uh, cut seconds. the hell out of our uh, out of our out of our budgets and deny our people the uh, access to uh, to services. Thank you, Dave. Well, a number of quick things. One, we learned during COVID that we don't actually have to incarcerate as many people as we have been. So there's savings there that can be put into our state colleges and other investments in our state to keep people working. The governor in the COVID uh, proposal he had put zero money to the Vermont state college system. And maybe that's not as big a deal to some of the folks in Chittenden County where we've got community college and some other opportunities, but it's a huge economic hit for the state, which would damage all of our future as far as the budget situation for the state if, if that were not funded. Legislature put that money in and I would support that kind of measure. We also, um, I would bond for some of the shortcomings in the school funding from the lack of sales tax. And I know that's unusual to do, but we should not have the next one or two years economy have to carry the burden and Vermonters carry the burden of 10 or 12 cent increases to pay for our schools. That would be incredibly damaging to many middle-class and working-class Vermonters. So I would bond for that to spread that cost out over time. 
And lastly, also related to our schools, I would work on issues like what one of the others talked about of really blending in human services and education at the frontline level to help students who are tr struggling and challenged uh, yeah. from birth through school and save money and create better access to services for those families. Thank you. Thank you. Pat. Well, if you go to my website at winburn2020.com, uh, I talk about uh, uh, my proposal to have a great reshuffling. Uh, we need a new New Deal. Uh, we need uh, you know the cards that everybody is uh, dealing with right now uh, were dealt out in the 20th century, and we need to flip those cards over and uh, look at the 21st century. Uh, the you know the the cards need to be uh, looked at, and we need to uh, you know review the policies of the past, and we need to move into the 21st century. And that's what I'll do uh, as the next governor of Vermont. Thank you, Pat. Let's talk about racial justice and local policing. In light of national protests in support of Black Lives Matter and to protest recent and historical killings of Black Americans, what do you see is your role as governor to support racial justice in Vermont? Ralph. The first thing to do to start the, uh, the, the ball rolling is to contact all the Vermont police departments and agencies and tell them that they were, are immediately to give back or scrap all, all uh, military weaponry that was obtained from the Pentagon. This has created the, the entire culture of oppression from a militarization of, of uh, police forces that used to be civilian forces and now have been turned into armies that wage war against, against the civilians and people of this country. That's the first step. Get rid of the military weaponry that encourages uh, police that are hired into the system to turn into uh, soldiers. That's number one. Ralph, I'm sorry for that particular interruption. I want to give you a few seconds if there was something you need to wrap up. Okay, you, you, need, you need a clown in every show. Usually that's me, but uh, anyway, no. sorry for the interruption. Apologize. Let's move forward. Dave? Well, first, I'm really impressed with the legislature's rapid action on S-119 to look at the use of force and criminal justice training council and shifting to one that's more balanced in terms of how we train our law enforcement officers uh, to the four hours of community development. We need to shift that and we need to shift some funding into mental health services, economic development, and other ways to make it so we have fewer need for law enforcement calls in the first place. We also uh, strongly support the social equity study bill, which became law last year, Act 1, around the issue of education standards to make sure people really understand the history and how we got where we are. We also need to fully fund and expand the funding of the racial equity uh, office in Vermont. And I prioritized uh, this as an issue in my very first movie of my movie series, which was called 13th, which anybody out there, like the people that Zoom bombed, uh, should go watch and really learn our history about half after we, we got rid of slavery, we basically allowed uh, state-sanctioned slave labor through our prisons. Dave, thank you. And again, I wanna to apologize to everybody for what's going on. Um, we're, we're trying to deal with it as fast as we can as it happens, so my, my apologies. Uh, Pat. Well, I would appoint uh, people of color to my uh, cabinet and I also, um, you know, would uh, I believe that in citizen oversight committees uh, for um, each town, I, the person who's Zoom bombing does not represent uh, the people of Vermont. But, you know, as a white person, it's my job to amplify those who are directly affected by systemic racism, and it exists everywhere from the criminal justice system uh, to education to health care and every aspect uh, of our lives. Implicit by Training is needed at every level of government and our communities, uh, so we can uh, begin acknowledging the program, the the problem, and address it. Uh, Vermont prides itself as being the first state to outlaw slavery, but that claim is hollow. From the treatment of the Abenakis to the exploitation of migrant workers uh, to driving while black pullovers. Thank you, Pat. Um, Rebecca. Um. This, 
I just want to share with you the story. I'm not going to share the name of the individual who told me this, but this underscores how serious this problem is. And I realize that the group of people who are interrupting today are a minority of Vermonters. But what we see is that there are a number of people who try to consistently terrorize our neighbors in ways that make them feel unsafe and unable to, to achieve their best potential and to contribute to the prosperity of our state. And as governor, I will make this my unrelenting goal to make sure every Vermonter, no matter who they are, but particularly our black and brown neighbors who deal with the kind of hostility we've seen here today, are, feel like they, we have their back and we will support them and we will stand up for them because they are as much Vermonters as we are and they have a right to be here and feel like they're free of this harassment. I've talked to people who thought about running for office and were afraid to do so because of this kind of behavior. I've talked to young students in school classrooms mm -hmm. who tell me that they are are afraid in school and tired because they just want to be kids and what they deal with is the need to push back against this kind of racism all the time. One of the most important things a governor can do is to make a very clear unequivocal commitment to the principle of liberty and justice for all and to make sure we plan for it proactively in every single aspect of state government operations. And that's what I'll do as governor because this kind of behavior is what is tearing us apart as a nation. It's what's tearing us apart at the state and the Vermonters I know will have nothing to do with it. And we will show up for our black and brown neighbors because we're not gonna tolerate that behavior. Thank you, I appreciate it. And again, I, I wanna apologize for everything that's been going on. I do want to ask the candidates right now um, collectively because of the fact that we are dealing with the situation. I do not want to have this evolve into somebody's entertainment versus being a responsible discussion on issues. Um, and so I would ask the candidates now how you feel about continuing or whether or not we should um, take a second. I think there's something that we could do right now, but it would take us a minute to try to clear the decks so that it's just us having this particular discussion. Would you be okay with just taking a pause for a second while we clear this out or would you I yeah, mean, we don't I, need I, to give weird. them any more platform for their racism. I agree. And I, I think Gavin has a suggestion. Yeah, I agree. All right. Thank you. So if you'll just give us a moment, anybody who wants to watch this particular video can do it on Channel 17 or on YouTube Live. You know, they can participate that way. So. All right. I have. I, I believe everyone who is still on the call is personally known to me. I apologize for uh, setting this up poorly. All right, let's, uh, let's leave it at this. And that way, again, people, we will let everyone know if they want to watch it, they can on, uh, on channel 17 or again on YouTube. Uh, but my deepest apologies, totally on. Not, un not your fault, Marcus. All right, so let's talk about, can, let's continue the conversation. Let's talk about racial justice and policing one more time, but let's talk about in defining, defunding the police. What does defunding the police mean to you? And how does that relate to Vermont policing in your mind? Um, we start with Dave. Well, thank you, Marcus. And thank you everybody for your patience getting through uh, that racism and hatred that uh, Zoom bombed us all. And I also wanna thank the other candidates who uh, also presented, I think what we all have, which is a unified position on these issues and some of the ideas of inclusion in our administrations uh, and, and so forth that the others all mentioned. With respect to defunding the police, I very much espouse uh, many of the words that Al Sharpton has talked about. Uh, defunding the police does not mean the elimination of funding. I think there are maybe a few that think that, but it means reprioritizing a portion of the funding for law enforcement into other community engagement activities that are far less um, loaded with law enforcement and far more towards mental health, towards economic development, in uh, depressed communities and in our BIPOC communities, and really shifting our focus away from the war on drugs to being an investment in our future and our kids' future. All of what defunding the police means is shifting from what we've done for the last 20 and 30 years between the issues of the 90s and, and 2000s, where it was fund police, throw people in jail, and that's how we somehow make our communities safer. That is not what has made communities safer. It has been unwise tax and spending that actually could be much more effective in education, in mental health, in de-escalation, in training our law enforcement to use 
uh, de-escalation techniques and not use of force. We need more social workers uh, who could actually go with law enforcement officers, which we're seeing successfully in Franklin County and Grand Isle County. We need more work towards programs around addiction uh, support services and those with substance abuse disorders. And we need to really shift, as I said earlier, law enforcement training, where right now on average in this country, it's 60 hours with firearms and four hours in community building. And we need to shift this focus and include bias training, uh, which obviously some people who just spoke in don't really understand their own internal biases uh, and various other de-escalation tactics. And I'm running out of time, so I appreciate uh, the opportunity. And again, thank you, Marcus uh, and Brian for bringing us back on track. Thank you. Um, Pat. Well, I, I don't uh, I don't think that the you know the state or the police should declare war on the people of uh, Vermont. And you know I agree with Ralph. I don't I don't believe in the militarization of the police departments. I'm a you know the moderator of Old Bennington and a past trustee. We have a very small police department, but we fund our own police department through our taxes. Uh, the state police are funded by uh, the state, but on you know on a local level we. You know, we should use um, school resource officers. We should use state-funded social workers. You know, Barry and Montpelier have been very innovative, um, you know, in that regard. And, you know, we should have homeless liaisons and, you know, and, and just not, you know, not militarized. Thanks, Pat. Rebecca. Sorry, I'm just unmuting. Well, well, I agree with much of what's been said. I think we've been disinvesting for years in people and investing in punitive strategies to control people once they become desperate. We know we have people in jail because they can't make bail. We know we have people in jail who are struggling with addiction who really need treatment, not jail. We know we have people in jail with mental health issues that land them up in jail and they need mental health treatment. We know that there are people in jail because there is no housing for them to go to, even though they've already fulfilled the terms of their incarceration. So we have chosen to be punitive in ways that cost us up to $70,000 a year per person, instead of investing in the kinds of social services that keep people safe. The one issue I do want to disagree on is the issue of school resources officers, because nationwide in the few empirical studies we've seen, school resource officers are associated with lower high school graduation, less likelihood of a attending college for people who are black. And as a state, until we are in control of our own racism and bias, we cannot be policing schools in ways that adversely impact the outcomes of our students. We need to be looking at investments that help them be healthy, not in being punitive in ways that we know will be disproportionately targeted at black and brown students. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, so along with what I uh, said before about the uh, a law banning any acceptance of uh, military weaponry by Vermont agencies. There also must be a statewide ban on torturous uh, devices such as tasers and tear gas, both of which in numerous cases have not only caused law lifelong debilities, but also deaths. These are weapons of torture not to be used for, for, uh, for use against civilians. On top of that, um, there must be a, um, what was the other thing? I lost the train of thought. There must be uh, any hiring of uh, people directly out of the military, especially from the battlefield, cannot be allowed directly into field police activities. They must be put into clerical duties for a minimum of three years while they undergo programs that help them to deprogram from the institutionalized uh, program they went through in the military to become uh, unfeeling killing machines that should they should not be hired directly from the battlefield Ten into seconds. some of the uh, police forces out in, out in the public thank you let's talk about housing um what do you see as being the most important housing policy to change in order to change the lives of low-income vermonters going back to pat well, I, I believe that, uh, you know, the housing policy has to change. Uh, you know, it's impossible for young people and millennials uh, to afford rent. You know, why I'm, you know, I, I would put uh, rent stabilization um, on the, the table. Um, you know, and we can also look at, uh, you know, people have large homes and 
historically, a lot of uh, Vermont towns have uh, beautiful, uh, large, old uh, homes. And, you know, I would, I would very seriously consider converting and uh, subsidizing uh, version to uh, multi-use, uh, you know, uh, portions of those homes. Um, I would also consider a, a one-time uh, incentive uh, for uh, seeing uh, homes. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, homes that are uh, that you know that are big and there's plenty. You know, there's plenty of room for everybody, and. You know, the other uh, aspect too, I, I've talked about this before, the you know, concept in Scandinavia of uh, tiny uh, house villages. Uh, you know, they can be built uh, quickly. Uh, it doesn't cram everybody in. Uh, it doesn't uh, provide, it doesn't cause the uh, COVID uh, problems that uh, everybody is very concerned about and uh, rightly so. Uh, but I think of affordable housing uh, is really a, a key to uh, Vermont's future in bringing in young people, which we need in, in, uh, in Vermont. Uh, we're an aging population and we need to bring in young people uh, as taxpayers and productive citizens of our state. Thanks. Rebecca. Got to mute. Um, just to just to pick up on it uh, in honor of some of the previous comments that were made. I just wanted to start by acknowledging that in Vermont we have well documented discrimination in our housing markets and our mortgage markets against Black and Brown Vermonters that for years prevented them from building assets through home ownership. They were we had deeds in our state that prohibited people from selling their homes to people of color. We have mortgage markets that discriminated against people in certain neighborhoods. That means they didn't have access to the opportunities for savings and tax benefits that come with owning a home. In Vermont, wealth inequality is even more severe than income inequality. And in Vermont, 71% of white house households are homeowners, while only 22% of black households are homeowners. So one of the things that we need to be careful about in all our policy with related to housing is making sure that we do it with an eye to equity. In, in addition, and beyond that, because we need to make a big change, because right now our problem is supply. We do not have affordable housing for families in walkable downtowns, sufficient in number for the people who need housing right now. And there are many reasons for that, but there's no one solution. Some communities need investments in municipal infrastructure and wastewater. Others, it may be expedited form code. As governor, I would like to look at how we're using our economic development dollars, not to just focus on holding on to businesses that are already here, but to invest right. in the next generation of Vermont entrepreneurs, including those who are using carbon-friendly materials and carbon-friendly designs to create affordable housing for Vermonters. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ralph. Uh, a couple of programs that the uh, state could implement. Um, they could be the uh, direct uh, implementer of uh, the uh, what's, what's known as a rent to own program that uh, where they could uh, possibly through funding and again, uh, trying to get federal funding from a uh, government that spent $740 billion on defense, hopefully to get some sort of funding um, to help to institute a rent to own program within the state that's, uh, you know, actually run by the, uh, by the state, uh, by, st by state the Vermont State Department, instead of through maybe, you know, like the way it's done through banks. Uh, again, like Mr. Winburn uh, mentioned, uh, tiny houses is a concept that, uh, that's been uh, bandied about at times uh, by some of the more uh, leading progressive uh, thinkers here in the state. And also the uh, home share program, again, Dependent on getting more funding, could be greatly um, promoted and increased in uh, certain ways after after study of that. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, Dave. Well, thank you. I'm actually going to continue on the home share uh, program that uh, Mr. Corbo talked about, where folks can actually uh, have others live in their home and help share the expenses. A lot of seniors are doing this, and they're on fixed income, often low income. We could make sure there's policy that says, if you open your home to someone else living in a room in your house, that their income doesn't apply towards your income sensitivity payments, uh, income sensitivity adjustments for property taxes. This would help a lot of seniors and fixed income folks stay in their homes longer, help supplement their income a little bit to afford to stay in their homes while not penalizing them with higher taxes. That would be something that I think would be very important. I would also look at 
either permanently or at least temporarily putting a higher property transfer tax on higher end homes, A, that are getting bought up right now by out-of-staters, but B, that higher end folks could afford in any respect, which would increase funding for Vermont Housing Conservation Board, which would lead to more funding for affordable housing each year. So we need to invest in more housing. It would be part of my Green Mountain New Deal program as well, to invest between 15 and $20 million a year in affordable, efficient, energy sound homes in our village and town centers. So again, people could also live and work in walkable communities, all of which would help low income residents uh, be able to live in their communities and work in their communities uh, with affordable housing. I would like to give each candidate one minute to address, uh, take this uh, one step further and address the issue of housing from the aspect of first time home buyers in the state of Vermont. Obviously, we want to retain people here. We want to keep young people here. What are your thoughts? Uh, and again, I'm going to give each candidate one minute to answer this question because it's just going in just a step further um, on, again, what would you do specifically for first time home buyers here in the state of Vermont? Um, coming back to Pat. Well, I don't think there's a cookie cutter you know, approach. Uh, there are federal programs uh, for uh, first home buyers. Uh, you know, I believe in mortgages with low interest or low interest uh, mortgages that uh, are uh, sort of stopped for a period of time. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, affordable uh, housing money needs to go to towns that are you know, from the state uh, that are earmarked for this. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca. Um, so, you know, I think we've already heard a number of ideas expressed by candidates here that would address that. Um, I think one of the issues that we frankly got to talk to about is college debt. One of the reasons I'm hearing from many, many young people that they can't afford to consider buying a house is because the devil levels of college debt that many young people carry are so high, it's prohibitive. But it's not enough, clearly. Um, you know, and I think we've talked about other, other ways to do this. You know, the other way we can address this is by bringing down some of the other costs that young families in particular are often saddled with. I mentioned some issues around, um, uh, you know, making childcare easier to afford by working together in ways that bring down the cost of childcare. I think also we need to look at potential opportunities for mortgage relief for young first time house buyers. We need to understand that if we don't have young people in the state, there will not be people staffing our hospitals, filling the jobs that need to be filled in order to take care of the entire state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ralph. I, well, I mentioned uh, previously, I think the, uh, the, uh, one of the initial uh, most um, conducive things is, is rent to own, uh, especially with uh, caps on the, on the monthly amount based on uh, the person's uh, income. Uh, where you are actually investing uh, a rental money on a month by month basis that's being applied to eventually purchasing the uh, the structure. I think that's um, that's probably would have the most appeal, I think, to uh, to, to people uh, in this day and age, especially, like I said, if you have uh, caps on it to uh, keep the monthly uh, rental uh, de depending on their uh, on their personal income. I think that would be the best way to uh, to start off with. And then other, uh, the other concepts of uh, home share and tiny houses, I think, are almost equally as important to uh, to, this, to the latter to uh, eventually bring the affordable housing to most of the world. Thanks, Ralph. Dave. Well, first, I think there's been a lot of great ideas. I do think sometimes folks have to rein in how many different ways they're going to give away money, uh, where some of the proposals I've heard just continue to add more and more to that. I've stayed focused on the Green Mountain New Deal where we would use money from the Trump tax cuts to the wealthiest Vermonters to build perpetually affordable housing in our village centers. We could partner with what is already landmark leading in the country organizations like the Champlain Land Trust, Housing Land Trust, the Vermont Land Trust, where affordable housing and perpetually affordable housing is built and then is also then sold when those folks move into their second home at an affordable price to the next person. We need to build more perpetually affordable housing to get off the treadmill of housing being purely an investment for returns for everybody when we're in the competitive housing markets with Boston and New York. Folks down there can afford to buy what we have at the drop of a hat for what they can sell their own homes in, in Boston, New York, Connecticut. And we need to make sure we build affordable housing for Vermonters to get into so they can get out from under some of those debts like 
uh, Rebecca talked about with college debt and others. And we need to invest, as she said, in our state colleges so that our, our debt coming out of those schools is either very low or zero. Thank you. Let's talk about economic development. Um, first off, I'd like to ask each one of you, um, and again, we're starting back uh, with, with a new rotation. Rebecca, you'll go first with two minutes. Um, what is your feelings about the remote worker program? Has it been successful? And what, if any, changes would you make to that particular program, Rebecca? So I got to be blunt, Marcus, the biggest barrier I see to remote workers is broadband. Um, my husband's a remote worker and we chose where we lived precisely because he needed to be in a space with good enough internet that he could commute by internet. And far too many places in the state don't have sufficient internet capacity or speed to be able to conduct business. And you know, we've, I don't belabor the issue because we've talked about it at every debate, but we spend far too much money to get far too little. And this is something we're just gonna have to get done. It's why I insisted that the state uh, schools put um, all their assessments online because that drove broadband as far as our school buildings and it's that much closer to everybody's front door. But when I've talked specifically about the remote worker program, I've talked to a lot of people who did receive some of those benefits and I gotta tell you, they're telling me they were gonna move here anyway, but they were happy to get the help with the moving costs. I actually think that money would be better spent on something like the rent to own program or preparing or giving young Vermonters who are already here and want to go to our state college system, get access to a nursing degree so they can fill one of those desperately needed positions in our hospitals or help somebody who wants to be a, a pediatrician or a primary care practitioner in a rural community, but can't afford to take that job because if they don't have help with their debt, they can't afford to work there. And if we don't find a way to help them work there, we will have no primary care doctors in some of our rural communities. So my point is there are many people who are here who want to be here and with just a little extra help, we could give them the skills to get a job job that didn't pay them minimum wage, but paid them a living wage to make the green energy transition we need to make, to build the green housing that we know we need to have, and to staff the jobs in our healthcare system that if we can't fill, we're dependent on out-of-state nurses, out-of-state traveling doctors who come in and get paid two to three times as much, and then take what they earn home where they came from and pay income tax someplace else. So I'm big on investing in Vermonters, and I know that if we invest in our people, they will invest in our state with their time and their bright hands and their willing hands and brains. Thank you. Thank you. Ralph. Uh, well, on the remote, um, remote um, working, um, depending on what type of business it is, if it's a business that's connected uh, to working for a, uh, any type of a company entity, I believe that company should be involved in uh, either uh, setting up the uh, structure for that person to uh, do the business uh, remotely in terms of uh, paying for a lot of that, uh, the, uh, whatever uh, devices are needed. Um, plus the fact if they wanted to get involved with a, uh, helping to implement more fiber optic uh, to create that, I don't think that should be, uh, that should be put uh, solely on, um, in a sense, it comes back to the Vermont uh, ratepayers when you have a uh, public utility company that uh, implements that and then the costs That's are passed right. on to everybody across the, uh, across the board. I think uh, these companies that are uh, directly have remote workers should have a, uh, a stake and a uh, uh, contribute to the uh, putting in the infrastructure to, to have a remote uh, working as long as it's not involved the, uh, like I said, there's fiber optics and not the, uh, the harmful and intrusive 5G right. type of, uh, type of okay. uh, sort. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, Dave. Well, first we have to put some of this in context. The remote, remote worker program is about a hundred or $200,000 a year. Uh, and so it's not, if we eliminate it, not gonna suddenly fund all these other great ideas that people are presenting. Uh, however, I do think we should have limited it with either a means testing model or something to that effect. As one of my uh, contemporary folks here indicated, many of these folks would be moving here anyway. So if they're already gonna move here, let's not subsidize something that was already going to happen. Let's put that money into uh, training programs or education programs at our state colleges so people could become 
nurses or teachers where we know we're gonna have a shortage of workers or put that money into expanding programs for elder care where we know as one of the oldest states in the country that we, we would want more visiting elder care services so people could age in place, live healthier, happier lives. And to really uh, get folks to move here, we need to build affordable housing. We need to build out broadband. We need to help support childcare and make more childcare options available. Those are much bigger issues in how to both retain Vermonters and attract people to Vermont uh, in order to build our economy in the future. Thank you. Pat. Well, I'm sure that it was you know, well-intentioned, but the remote, remote worker program is really a bit of a farce. You know, we don't need to bribe people to come to Vermont. Uh, you know, we need to brand Vermont as a place to come. We have cultural centers. You know, Vermont is a unique place. Uh, we have a, a unique uh, culture. And, uh, you know, we don't need a caretaker governor like Governor Scott, uh, you know, who's, uh, you know, go, going to support these kind of uh, programs. Uh, people want to come to Vermont because it's such a great place to live. Thank you. So I would like to um, expand on this just a bit. So I'm going to give one minute to each candidate just to expand a little bit more from the aspect of listening to Vermonters. What I hear a lot is the expectation that we're going to draw businesses that come here with lots of jobs. So what are the industries? What are the ways, you know, quickly that you would end up going after those businesses or industries that could come to Vermont and bring us a number of jobs. Um, going back and to the beginning, starting with Rebecca. So, so I'm, I'm going to answer that question first. And you know, when I was Secretary of Education, we spent a lot of time thinking about what were our priority sectors, and we looked at a lot of data in the state and the areas where we see high wages and high growth in Vermont and lots of opportunity are in the healthcare sector, um, in the green energy, green technology or smart grid solutions sector, the green construction sector and advanced manufacturing, including green manufacturing. These are sectors where we can graduate students with industry recognized credentials right out of high school and they can walk into a job that pays them $25 an hour. This is where the three to 5,000 young people between 18 to 21, if we could get them the right skills, could find a way to reconnect with the economy. But I want to push back a little bit because Vermont can't only be looking at bringing new businesses from other states to here. We have wonderful entrepreneurs and I've been calling them and speaking to them all over the state who actually want to start businesses in Vermont that reflect our green, sustainable, and renewable brand. We need to understand that much of what we need is right here at home. We just need to organize ourselves to harness the potential of the people here who want to make it work. Thank you. Ralph. Um, well, I think uh, you might, um, Jim, that was uh, previously said, you might want to look inward first. I mean, uh, Vermont has the potential in terms of agriculture to become uh, the epicenter of, of organic agriculture, possibly on the east, eastern seaboard, maybe even the whole country. Uh, if we could get over the this obsession with um, the dying um, dairy industry, which is a uh, obsolete at this point, and come to the conclusion that we have to try to uh, transition into a, into a new type of agriculture, we could uh, take it a step further and become, like I said, the, uh, with the again, with the proper funding and uh, grants and stuff, which uh, are gonna take some federal funds. 10 seconds. We could, we could become the organic uh, breadbasket in the sense of the Eastern seaboard at the very least by transitioning into, uh, into, uh, into a, a major organic farming industry here. Thank you, Dave. Well, thank you. There's a few things here. First, we have to point out that New York State has more money in tax credits to attract businesses than the whole Vermont state budget. So I think the premise of the question saying, how are we going to land a big employer is really not the Vermont way to build our economy. It's actually to invest in our small businesses, help them grow from two and three and five person businesses to 15 and 20 person businesses. My farm when I started had one part time worker. Now we're up to five year round and six seasonal workers. If we can expand jobs in those ways, uh, whether they be farming jobs, which are actually going up in wages, 
as well as investing in broadband, affordable housing. When you talk to business owners, they actually, their employees want to have a good education system. We need a governor that's not going to bash our education system, but actually speak to the truth of our education system, which is that it's one of the best rural education systems in the country. We get a bang for our buck and stop distorting uh, the issues in our education system. I would, uh, as I have for 25 years, advocating for reforming our cannabis laws. We could have a craft cannabis industry like we do a craft beer industry, which would attract uh, tourists and money into the state and create those good paying jobs. And I would work on renewable energy jobs, which again, under this administration, we've lost 500 uh, solar installation jobs in the last couple of years. We need to reverse right. the incentives and invest in those jobs. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Pat. My wife and I have uh, run a small business in Vermont for the last 34 years. We have a top uh, practice. Uh, we have five employees, including myself. We uh, pay good benefits uh, for every everybody. We have, uh, you know, programs for uh, health care, uh, for, you know, pension type of 401ks. And, you know, that's what Vermont needs. We need uh, good businesses to come. Uh, to Vermont, and we need to provide incentive, you know, uh, as a government, uh, you know, to uh, bring businesses that demonstrate that they pay a livable wage. Otherwise, you know, it's a cost uh, shift uh, to the government. You know, uh, we need, uh, you know, to to help uh, the big businesses. But you know, I agree with Rebecca. This this is too, or really, uh, and and David, uh, the the sort of the lifeblood of, of Vermont, and probably always will be. Thank you. Moving on to our next uh, subject is education. So let's um, kind of going off of something that Pat just said and, and Rebecca, you touched on, everybody's kind of touched on it a bit. Let's talk about education funding in the state of Vermont. One of the things that um, I hear quite often and I think is discussed quite a bit is either the burden or the complexity. So as you think about education funding in the state of Vermont, how would you improve? education funding for better outcomes. Starting off with Ralph, you have two minutes. Well, it's a little complicated. I've never really looked into that that much. Um, I would have to say one of the basic things I think is the uh, property tax, which um, I don't know if this is the right uh, economic time to do it, but I think eventually should be uh, should be geared to um, different gradations of uh, and uh, percentage is based on uh, whether you're a senior citizen without any children in school, uh, uh, whether you're a couple, whether younger couples with no children in school. Um, at the same time, uh, maybe high income people with uh, lar a large family of children, uh, sort of a, a re um, reshuffling, I guess, of the uh, property tax um, um, form the way it is now and maybe doing some uh, things uh, to uh, change it in, uh, along the lines of what I just mentioned. All things that can be thought about, I think it's something that would have to be, you don't have to sit down, anybody's got to sit down with uh, nonpartisan experts, which unfortunately we don't get a lot, especially in this current administration that can give you the, uh, the bottom line tax without uh, kind of uh, politics involved and we'd have to uh, do a complete uh, review of it. Uh, hopefully come up with some uh, more uh, uh, equitable uh, uh, ways to, uh, to administer, I think, especially from the perspective of the, of the property tax being used to fund most of education. Thank you. Dave. That's about all I can add to that. I appreciate it. Dave. A couple of things. I've served on the Ways and Means Committee in the House and the Education Committee in the Senate, and I'm pleased to say I have the endorsement of the Chair of Education, uh, Philip Ruth, and also the endorsement of Senator Chris Pearson from Chittenden County, who's on the Finance Committee. So if we want to talk about shifting education funding and helping alleviate the burdens, having those folks on your team is, uh, is really helpful. Now, one of the bills that was introduced by Senator Anthony Polina, who also has endorsed me, is to make the income sensitivity provision go all the way to the top 30% of taxpayers as well. If that were done with a million dollar income uh, tax cap, so it wouldn't be outrageous on those folks, it would actually do a $30 million 
tax reduction on the 70% of Vermonters who do get income tax uh, sensitivity on your property tax bill. So if you get any adjustment on your bill right now, your bill would be uh, lowered under that law. And I think it's also important to look at the cost of education and where we can blend some of the expenses that have been put on education around social services and blend them with the agency of human services, which is happening in some places, but not everywhere. So if we wanna address costs, we need to look at those ideas at the front lines on the ground level to help with that in education, education excuse me. Pat. Well, I, we do pay a lot for education in Vermont, uh, but we also have the highest graduation rate in the country. And I think a big part of that is because we have excellent uh, teachers in Vermont. Um, you know, the property tax system overly stresses and really pits taxpayers uh, versus teachers. And that really is not the way to go. I think income tax should uh, be uh, what supports education. And I think it's time for the top 5% uh, to, you know, to pay their share. They've gotten the benefits uh, from all the tax cuts that uh, Trump's given them. Uh, and I think it's now time for, um, you know, for, uh, for the top 5% uh, to pay their way. Thank you. Rebecca. Thank you. Um, there are three ways that we need to address this challenge. And the first is we need to make sure we know what's in the education fund. The second is to make sure we change the way we disperse the money that we raise. And the third is that we need to change how we raise. First thing I learned in business school was that if you're worried about costs, you have to focus on what's driving increased costs in whatever budget you're looking at. We know that in Vermont, what's driving increases in our education fund isn't teachers. We're actually reducing the number of educators we have. It's healthcare, it's pre-kindergarten, it's the mental health that we need to provide, the supports to kids as our state system has completely failed. And it's not because it's not competent people because it isn't adequately funded for its job. And it's the cost of tuition vouchers in districts that don't have public schools. What all four of these things have in common is that school boards actually can't control them. So one of the things that we have to do is make sure that everything in the education fund is actually something that school boards can control or they can't be expected to reasonably bring down those costs. Second, we need to make sure that the way we disperse money adequately accounts for the higher cost of educating kids in rural schools, in economically disadvantaged communities, and students who are learning English. And there's pretty significant evidence right now that we are grossly underfunding those kids relative to their needs. And that's something we can address, particularly if we address some of the other costs in the education fund. And the third is we need to make sure and have hard questions about how we raise revenue. I did an awful lot of modeling. I think we need yep. to do comprehensive reform because you can't change the ed fund without changing how we tax on the income side for the general fund. But it's very clear one thing we could do is think of housing as something that's essential and doesn't get taxed up to okay. a certain level the same way we don't tax food. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to our last question. Um, this is uh, specific for Essex. And I think that, uh, you know, I look forward to hearing your, your responses to this. So in regards to the town of Essex and what we've recently, what's recently happened here on town meeting day, Essex did approve a charter change uh, by the voters for a three plus three representation on our select board. Um, it was pushed off by the legislature, um, which did manage to pass other charter changes for other towns. So I'm, Curious for each candidate to uh, let let us know what is your feeling about whether or not towns should have local control over their own charter, or do you believe the legislature has a role in approving these local mandates? Um, so, starting at the beginning, uh, I believe that's that's Dave. So, all right. Uh, first of all, I do believe uh, very much in local control, and the legislature does uh, regularly approve charter changes fairly quickly. Uh, but I've seen over the 20 years I've been in the legislature, some that are a little more complicated. And this one, unfortunately, is one of those. And I just spoke with the chair of the House Government Operations Committee. I'm actually in her house doing this Zoom because it's her 50th birthday party. And I'm hanging out with her later tonight after this show. Uh, and to ask, why didn't this move? What happened? And she said it was actually getting right onto the agenda when COVID struck. And admittedly, there were some other issues with COVID in government operations, one being the voting issue and vote by mail, which I think Marcus, you talked about at the very beginning, 
the need for folks to vote and vote by mail. That ended up being more contentious than we had thought because the governor got in the way of it for a while. Uh, so they had to take up that legislation. They also had to deal with many, as government operations uh, uh, committee has to do, many of the issues around law enforcement and the changes in law enforcement and policies around the Black Lives Matter issue and racial injustice. And so when there's a complicated charter change, they have to delve into it and they are planning to do so. Uh, and the, the issue that I understand, and again, I'm happy to hear from folks in Essex, is that it was gonna shift from the current five member board to a six member board. And they were curious, and normally they would work this out with the town mothers and fathers who would come testify, is how would you make that shift from five to six if the current balance is not three to two and you would just be adding one in the other half of the community, as well as uh, what would happen in part of the language, my understanding is, that it would shift to proportional uh, representation from three to three to maybe four to two in the future if the populations shifted uh, dramatically. And that wasn't really defined in that change as well. So they're ready to move it. They believe in local control, but they do have to work out those details with the communities. And I think in August and September, they're gonna be looking into that so that they can move this bill forward and allow the charter change to happen. It does sound like there's also a vote in November that may also impact uh, these changes. So they may end up waiting depending on what that, uh, what they hear from the town mothers and fathers uh, with respect to how those work or don't work together. So but Dave, yes, just, local... just a fair clarification question, I, again, just very specifically, do you believe yes or no, that the legislature needs to be a part of the process for charter changes for local municipalities or should municipalities be able to do it on their own? Well, that's been uh, the law as long as I've been there and it's generally worked out quite well and the legislature has sometimes found glitches in some of these changes that have then gone back and been fixed in the local vote. So before the change was made and the glitch became a problem, it was resolved uh, with the legislature asking for a review. So okay. Dylan's law, which is the, the rule that uh, guides this, uh, I think is good, but it is important that we also affirm those votes of local communities, which has happened every time I can remember uh, in the legislature. Thank you, Pat. No, I don't think the legislature should be in control and hold up small towns, um, you know, uh, with who want to change their or want to have their own charters. Uh, in Bennington, uh, there's been an effort to have a, a mayor system of government. And there's no reason why the legislature. Uh, should uh, tell uh, Bennington what to do. Uh, it, it is local control, but it, you know I, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, has a pilot program where they're uh, going to have ten uh, small towns that um, you know uh, that uh, would be you know, uh, uh, have a pilot program for those small towns. And I, I think Essex uh, would be a great candidate to be one of those ten uh, towns uh, because I think they deserve to to have their own, you know, chart their own destiny. Thank you. Rebecca. Um, I mean, in terms of how it stands right now, I think other candidates have said that currently the General Assembly does have the power to grant charters of incorporation. It's a constitutional issue. I think the larger issue is, does the is there value in having the legislature weigh changes because of the potential impact of granting a charter in one community for the impact in terms of uh, operations in another community? And I, and I think sometimes it does make a difference. And the more we fragment or, or specialize, there are also implications to the state in terms of how it provides services or how it supports communities. So sometimes decisions that are entirely internally coherent in an individual community may actually affect another community in ways that no one thought about just because they're focused on their own affairs. I'm, I agree that uh, my suspicion is that this was slowed down because of COVID-19. I think there are many other priorities that were slowed down as well, but there is real power in deliberation sometimes in helping us understand the broader implications of the individual changes we make. That said, I agree that a long-term problem of the state has been assuming that one time all, uh, one size fits all policy. We've certainly seen it in education and it's raised our costs and it's made sometimes our policies not responsive to local community needs. So we do need to hear what the people of Essex are saying. Thank you. Ralph. Oh, well, yeah, there's not too much I can offer on this and we get much of a chance to research it. I didn't see the questions too late, but um, I guess uh, I would say in general, no, but I guess you have to have a review when it comes to a charter change or whatever change of a local government to make sure 
uh, maybe by having a, um, a lawyer connected to the state and knowing all the legislation to make sure that uh, what's been changed in the charter isn't uh, in the sense in violation of uh, whatever type of laws might be on the books. I guess, because uh, then it's going against the state law. I guess. So, like I said, not really knowing much about this issue. That's about all I can add to it. That, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, local should have the, uh, the authority to make a change. But I guess I think it would probably need to be reviewed then to make sure it was in compliance with state laws. So. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you thank all you, the Ralph. candidates for participating in tonight's forum. Again, my apologies for the earlier BS. Um, but I do appreciate you sticking with it and being here for this discussion. It's really important, again, that the entire electorate get to know you so they can make this very important decision. And I would encourage everyone to, again, reach out to your town clerk, get your ballot ahead of time, get it filled out, and get it mailed back in. So, again, thank you to all of you. Thank you to Brian Sheldon and to Tony for putting this together. Uh, and thank you for asking me to moderate. But again, thank you to all of you who participated and watched respectfully. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. That was really great. Thank you for a really solid issues focused debate. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Again, take care. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you for participating. Bye.